On this episode, we're talking to investigative producer Chris Todd about the O.J. Simpson case and the Zodiac Killer. So we got Chris Todd, investigative producer, on the show. Uh, do you want to start off by telling us, you know, about a little bit about your background and and how you got started in this, and then we'll move forward into to the other stuff. Sure. Yeah, my name is Chris Todd. Uh, I'm an investigative producer and author uh, here in Los Angeles. I've been working true crime cases for about eight years. And before that, I was a producer, director, writer in Hollywood for 20 years. And I have about three books out right now. And I've been working on this case that we're going to talk to today, this mafia story about the O.J. Simpson murders uh, for about five years now. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you and your and your audience. Yeah, th- yeah. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm glad to have you have you on. And it's it crazy when I when you first told me about the O.J. Simpson and the connection with the mafia, and I've been following, you know, what you're saying, and and yeah, it's it's pretty awesome stuff that you've you've come across, and I'm, I believe it. I, do, do, do I tell, would you be able to tell the people you know who don't know? So far, how how the mafia was involved with that case? Of course, yeah. So, and there's some stuff that's already been leaked and sourced to the media. So uh, the O.J. Simpson murders on June 12, 1994, was committed by O.J. Simpson, but he had an accomplice. And that guy's name is Charlie Ehrlich. And he was a mobster from Miami, uh, Genovese, and close to the Meyer Lansky crew. His roots go back many years. And if you know a lot about the mafia stories and legends, a lot of these guys connect. So all the families actually connect in some way. They're not as separate as you think they are. Um, So yeah, it's a fascinating story. He came to myself and another producer in Hollywood that he wanted to tell his story. And he tried to hide a couple of things about the cocaine and the drugs and some of the elements of the murders with OJ. And, And there was another guy named Joey Ippolito who was also involved in setting up the murders the murders were not premeditated so i don't want it to sound like this was a drug hit it wasn't a drug hit yeah it was it was kind of a spontaneous thing that charlie and joey kind of set oj off almost like a time bomb on sunday night june 12th and uh you know the, the rest is american history and we can go into details of that depending on how much time we have but so yeah yeah, for sure yeah yeah. Yeah. as much time as you want that's okay um so, yeah. so how did they first uh meet though like uh, oj and, and um you know charlie f- from from that point sure so so oj and charlie had only known each other for three months the connection the real mob connection with oj goes back almost 20 years and yeah. when oj was in buffalo he was already entangled in some cocaine dealings there were investigations with him against some of his friends one of his friends got murdered Actually, two weeks after the murders, he was from Buffalo and he was living in Miami. There's a big Miami connection to all this, as you'll see. Um, And this guy, Joey Ippolito, had known O.J. Simpson for many years. And Joey Ippolito was a coke smuggler and marijuana smuggler in Miami. He's originally from New Jersey and they were part of the De Cavalcante crime family. Um, People have come forward that Joey was involved over the years. I had people, sources, investigators come to me and say, Joey told me he was involved in the murders many years ago. I didn't believe him. And I'm sure Joey could play these cards a certain way. Yeah, I had something to do with those murders. And Joey had extorted a lot of people. He had people killed. There were a lot of people that died around Joey at Polito. And obviously with any mob guy, you're going to have that. So, you know, the mafia's mandate is, Gambling, prostitution, drugs, extortion, murder, right? So it all kind of ties in. And OJ, OJ liked the fast life. OJ liked the women. He cheated on his wives and his girlfriend many times. That's all documented, okay? He liked drugs. He was addicted to cocaine. And unfortunately, he started to really get closer to Joey in about 93 and 94. And Charlie was introduced to him in 1994, literally a couple months before the murders. So we can go into the dynamics of how this all happened, but that's the background of Joey Ippolito and OJ and AC Cowling's connection to the mafia in LA, in Miami, 
And if you look at OJ's suicide letter, he thanks Don Sofer. Why is he thanking Donnie? Don was a big mob guy. He owned Turnberry Isle. That was a known mafia hotspot. And OJ used to frequent there all the time. Yeah. So, so there's these, all these connections. There's many other rich guys that get tied in. I'm not going to say too many of their names today, but yeah, it's a fascinating story. And, and I'm, I'm glad you're able to be receptive to it. And I think the truth needs to come out. Right now, I'm being censored by the media, yeah. nonstop, 24-7. So the people like you that have courage, that's why I'm, I'm willing to talk to people like yourself. Oh, for sure, man. I'm, I'm glad to have you here. And I'll try and yeah, give you as much time as, as you want and, and to tell your mm -hmm. story. I think it's, it needs to be heard. Sure. It, it was a connection strictly with OJ and, and Joey. Did, did they, was that just from drugs? They, that's how they met? Is through the drug trade? Yes. And if you look up Joey at Belito, the speedboat racers, nine of the 16 speedboat racers get indicted on cocaine smuggling. Why? Yeah. Why? All the cocaine cowboys, Sal Magluda, right? All these guys, John Roberts. John Roberts, his name was not John Roberts. It was John Riccobono. Okay. These guys all have different names. They ran this big drug smuggling front for guess who? Meyer Lansky. Because look at the date when Meyer died. I think it's in 82 or 83. He was still active till the very end. And a lot of the stuff, the heyday was kind of the late 70s, early 80s. And it did continue. Joey got busted in 81 and had to go to jail for a few years. And that's documented. That was in Long Island. They were coming up from Miami in a huge barge with 30 guys on it with high tech radar, night vision. Why? Because it's a professional operation. So, so they're all in big think about that night vision in 1981. Yeah. That's... Did, did we, did anyone even have that? They did. So, so there's the connection. It's shocking for people to hear like OJ Simpson and the mafia, huh? And look, I've done a few interviews, done some radio stuff. I'm not saying OJ Simpson had a scale in his bathroom and he was weighing out drugs. That's not what we're saying. We're saying is he was tied to these guys introducing athletes, actors. Um, there was point shaving, gambling, NFL stuff. Who's the perfect person to do that? OJ Simpson. He knows all the famous people. And if you really, you have to, I know a lot about OJ, obviously, but to the lay person, OJ was like a god to kids. Okay. Yeah. He was. He was the juice on the Wheaties box. He carried the torch in LA for the Olympics. So so he was this mythical figure, good looking, charismatic, had a great voice. He was a good actor. Okay. The, the, he was in his own, on his own pedestal. Okay. So if there's any investigations, which there were with drugs for OJ, are you really going to arrest OJ Simpson? So he knew that he could play that card, you know? Yeah. Cause just going off using who he is, he can get away with it. Unless you catch like 40 yeah. kilos on him, yeah. you're going you're gonna to take him to prison because he knows a drug dealer? Yeah. He was smart, man. I'll tell you this whole thing. I look at cases. I worked many other famous murder cases, and I worked civilian also. Yeah. This one's very cerebral. You really got to ha have your head on straight to understand this one. Yeah. So, so, so can you tell me, you know, from how it started to escalate more, how their relationship got in, entwined even more closer leading up to that, mm -hmm. that, that night where the murders happened and, and then up to those murders, how it went down. Sure. So I had a source come forward. Obviously, look, I don't know OJ personally. I've tried to hang out with him. He doesn't want anything to do with me. Yep. And that's fine. I'm close to Charlie. I know a lot about Charlie. I know a lot about the Ippolitos. He still has a couple of brothers alive. I've communicated with both of them. They're good guys. They're cool guys. A lot of the mob guys are pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. If you cross them, yeah, you're up shit's Creek. Right. But they're pretty cool. They know Joey was involved. They don't want to say it. They're not going to tell you for no money. They want to be paid, which I don't mind. I don't mind hustlers sometimes to get the information out. If you have to pay Joey's brothers, pay them. Yeah. Hollywood has billions of dollars. This is an important story. Pay the people. It's okay. So, but to, as the timeline, OJ knew Joey in the 80s, okay, in the 1980s. AC Collins knew Joey a lot closer in the early 90s. 
Okay. He bodyguarded for him. He was a driver for him. He's caught with Joey. It's in, it's in a published article in 1994. Why no one made the connections to these guys? There's a couple of reasons, but so their relationship was really good for a long time. Now, Joey gets arrested in 92 and he goes on trial in 93 for selling cocaine to an undercover informant who is actually a mobster from the New England mob. Okay. That's published. It's called o Operation Lassima, L.A. Sicilian Mafia. Yeah. He gets busted. He's going back to jail. He starts to become an informant, and he's almost on the run. He jumps his bond or the jail, whatever you want to use the word. He gets out of jail a couple months before the murders. He's on the loose, and he sets an extortion against O.J. Simpson for about 100 grand. And he sends Charlie to 360 Rockingham, OJ's house, to go get his money. And OJ freaks out. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you squeezing me? It's in this screenplay. They wrote a script about it. It's in here, okay? So there's also a tape. There's a taped version of Charlie talking about this, okay? I haven't heard the whole tape, okay? Just to put that out there, that's in a safe. I've heard parts of it. Not everyone gets to hear the whole thing because I've had other partners. I wasn't the I wasn't the initial guy to meet Charlie, so you know. Um, and so it escalated. It was an extortion because I'm not going to blame Nicole and Faye Resnick and O.J. Simpson so much. You need to blame Joey Ippolito. And you need to blame Charlie. Okay, that's who you need to blame. Now, did O.J. take it too far? Of course. Should he have gotten on his plane like he told the bail bondsman in Vegas? Should have just got on my plane, man. Yeah, because they because he knows he should have. His bags were packed. They're on the bench. Yeah. There was a limo coming in 15 minutes. Should have just got on his plane, but he didn't. And we can't turn back the hands of time. Yeah, so, so it definitely wasn't like a, a premeditated murder, like like you're saying Correct. before. And, and, so and they what, messed, yeah. And oh, they sorry. messed that up. Marsha Clark. I just want to say this real quick to you, what you're gonna say. Marsha Clark yeah. messed that up. The prosecution, Chris Darden, Bill Hodgman. Hank Goldberg, they messed this up. It wasn't premeditated. It wasn't. And they, and they also have the timeline wrong. They have the murder starting at 10, 15, 10, 20. They're way off. I mean, not way off. They're off by 15 minutes. But in a trial, if you're off by, it sets everything backwards, yeah. you know? So they just drop the ball on the whole thing, pretty much. Well, the evidence doesn't line up. So if some yeah. people are telling you the dogs start barking at, 10, 15, 10, 20, and other people tell you they're not barking till 10, 35, and there's no blood outside when the blind date walks past Nicole's house, literally past her doorway at 10, 29 p.m. They see no blood. They hear no barking. They would have walked through the blood. It ran across the sidewalk. Yeah. So, so they saw and heard nothing, and the prosecution just erased them, just decided no, 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 we're not going to believe that. Yeah. And so then what happens, like, do you know the specifics of what happened with the murder? Yeah, I mean, I know Charlie doesn't say too, too much about the murders because the more he tells us, he could go to jail. There's no statute of limitations on yeah. murder, right? Yeah. So I, through my investigation, the way I've told the story before is, I pretty much know what happened, okay? They both killed them. Not Nicole, they both kill Ron Goldman. There's two knife wounds on Ron. The coroner tells you that on tape, in trial, under oath. There's two morphologically different types of stab wounds on the victims. He gets kicked off the case after one day because he wow. said there were two knives. Yes. So I'm not saying Charlie stabbed Nicole. There is some evidence that there is a double edged blade. I don't think he stabbed Nicole. He doesn't talk about it, he's never going to tell. Even on the tape, he doesn't say that he's stabbing them. That's not how he tells the story. So, um, but if you use that, you have to use evidence. I mean, his shoe prints are in blood at the crime scene, 10 and a half size parallel line shoe prints. There's like four of them. Okay. His fingerprints are there. There's a lot of evidence that he's in the crime scene and he's active. Okay. So that's, as for details, I don't want to get caught in the minutia. OJ slit Nicole's throat, OJ killed Nicole, and OJ helped Charlie kill Ron Goldman, okay? Yeah. That's why two people could get murdered 
and no one hears any screams. Yeah. Nobody, it's like, dude, dude, 1030 at night in LA is like yeah. daytime. And they're yeah. seven feet from the sidewalk. I've been there three times. It is close and it's a busy street. It's off Wilshire Boulevard. Yeah. So some, yeah, someone would have heard something for sure. Yeah, I mean, how do you kill two? And one, look, OJ could kill two people. I'm, you know, I'm sure anybody could. Your adrenaline's going, you're <laughs> six foot, 200 pounds. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying he couldn't, but Ron Goldman was about 5'11 and a half, okay, 170 pounds, young guy fighting for his life. Yeah. Okay. The door's three feet from him, three feet. Why couldn't he run out? He can't run out because he's got two guys on him pushing him into this killing cage. It's like a, it's almost like a cage. He's trapped, you know? Wow. And so, yeah. so the murders happen. And what, what's the aftermath of that? Is, is OJ and Charlie still cool with each other? And what, is, well, what happens there? So basically the way the screenplay tells it, the way the confession talks is they don't talk to each other for five years. They do not say a word to each other. So Charlie goes back to Miami. OJ moves on with his life. Remember, he's in jail for a year and a half. Yeah. Okay. They don't speak at all. Well. Okay. So after he's acquitted on October 3rd, 1995, they still don't speak. Now, when OJ moves to Miami in about 1999, that's when they reconnect. And that's how they play it in here too, is that's how they, they meet at a party again. Oh, how you been? Hey, it's good. We didn't talk. You know, we, we shouldn't have talked to each other. Yeah. How's, how you been? They pretend like they haven't, which look, you wouldn't talk to each other either. Yep. You need, you need to disappear. And Charlie never came back to LA ever again, ever in his life. And he's like 68 years old right now. Wow. It's, it's crazy. how no one else has put that together as well. What, what I was it? surprised. Well, you know, look, OJ wrote a book called if I did it. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. In 2006, he wrote a book called If I Did It. That's why I wrote a book called If We Did It. Wow, yeah. Okay. And then this, the follow-up was Ron's Revenge. Yeah. Okay. But my point is, OJ told the world in 2006 that he had an accomplice. He calls him Charlie. Charlie brought the knife and Charlie followed this guy in. Somebody's got to get rid of the bloody clothes. I mean, what are you going to do with them? Yeah. he told us okay he didn't say charlie's last name then he went on fox and did a, an interview with judith regan and said this guy charlie showed up to my house and i forgot why he had been by nicole's house but he said you wouldn't believe what's going on over there and i said whatever's going on over there has got to stop and he tells you and he takes you through it's fascinating watch it it's on youtube read chapter six watch the judith regan interview I, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, Thomas, because the other day, and I go through these strange like epiphanies on this. I've been living this for five years, every day, every second of my life. I thought the same thing. How did no one figure it out? If he told you in a book, if he told you on TV that there was someone else there, why didn't you investigate that someone else was there? Yeah. And it would have showed, it would have popped up because guess who gets arrested with O.J. Simpson in Las Vegas in 2007? Charlie Ehrlich. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's So crazy. the, dots, the yeah. dots could have been connected, right? Who's this guy, Charlie? There, who's this guy in O.J.'s book? Who's this guy in the interview? And yeah. if you did any homework and you run his name, he's a five-time convicted felon. Yeah. Assault, kidnapping, weapons cocaine dangerous drugs trafficking yeah it, it, it was it was possible to solve it you're i think that's what you're hinting at yeah do you think that do you think they will or that they actually don't want to i don't think they want to and yeah. we've had contact with the lapd we've already gone to robbery homicide the whole cold case unit they yeah. don't really care i'll be honest i respect them for talking to us they don't yeah. care you have a double jeopardy on oj can't use them can't do anything with oj yeah. And, you know, you have a taped confession from Charlie Ehrlich, but what if he says, I made it all up? Yeah. See, so, you know, I've, to be honest, look, I like to be cerebral about these things a little bit too. Yeah. 
When you have a murder case that's cold, there's a lot of problems, right? Yeah. If you don't have hard DNA evidence, you don't have a videotape, if you don't have some eyewitness, okay? I almost don't care what you have. You could have someone come forward and go, I saw OJ and Charlie murder those two people. Guess what the, guess what the defense attorneys are gonna do? Discredit that person up and down. Who are you? Are you an investigator? Why didn't you come forward? They're gonna shred everything. You could have shoe prints, a hat. You have Charlie's hat in the Bronco. You could have that. You could have his bloody shoe prints. How do you know they're his shoes? Does he still have them? Did he wear them at the merch? Somebody else took my shoes. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've learned a lot of watching this trial, especially this is kind of the granddaddy of them all. Yep. I've watched other trials. I've, I've researched a lot of other murder cases. You see this a lot. Okay. It's, I had a case. I worked, I, I looked at a case in Miami of a guy was on tape murdering three people on wow. tape. He took his mask off in front of the camera like this. He didn't know there was a camera in the house wow. and he got off. Holy shit. Okay. Yeah. So nobody talked to me about evidence. Yeah. We, we look to God, right? Yeah. Did they do it or not? It doesn't matter if they went to jail or not. It doesn't matter if the cops, I don't care what the cops say. Oh, well, the cops didn't arrest them. Oh, the cops don't arrest a lot of people. There's 2,000 unsolved murder cases in LA. Why don't you go tell all the families of those people, their kids, their brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, go tell them it didn't happen. And that guy didn't kill him because the cops said so. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty crazy. I can, you know, wild, still, yeah. still get off like being on camera as well. That guy, yeah, that case is pretty crazy. You can look it up. It's yeah. called the Butch Sukarski murder, Nicolo Casey's Nickelodeon murders. So, I mean, yeah, there's just, that's why when people, I, I deal with a lot of reporters, I deal with a lot of investigators, PIs, cops, I do federal cases too with FBI. And people always, what's the evidence? What's the evidence? Stop, yeah. stop, stop. There's no such thing as evidence. <laughs> There really isn't. And I know that sounds crazy. OJ Simpson's blood was mixed with the victim's blood together in his Bronco. Did he get off? Yes. So yeah. just, just exactly like just yeah. just just kind of open your heart and open your mind. See it for what it is. Look at the psychology. And if you have a string of coincidences, yeah. like OJ was there, his shoe prints there. That's his shoe, size 12. His blood's there. His DNA is dripping from his left finger next to his shoes. Use the coincidences. Yep. Sometimes you can't have what you call fact. You don't know. These, these defense attorneys are brilliant. They can put doubt in anything. I've seen it. I've seen them do it. That's why they call them the dream team. Yep. You had the best attorneys in the country all on the same team. F. Lee Bailey, Robert Shapiro, Johnny Cochran, Barry Sheck. Uh, Peter Newfeld, Sean Holly, uh, Gerard Ullman, Dershowitz. They're all on the same team. Yeah. Carl Douglas. They'll never be that again. That's why they call them the dream team. Yeah. How did they assemble such a, a strong team then just, just for that? Like, that's, it doesn't Rob, seem Rob, like they do that for anyone else. Robert Shapiro began it. And there was actually another um, uh, uh, lawyer first, Howard Weitzman. Okay. Now there's rumors that he got kicked off the case, but Howard Weitzman, he died. But he would tell you, I walked away because once he figured out, he saw the evidence coming in and he ditched OJ. I have something else about a famous studio exec that helped OJ Simpson get Robert Shapiro, who knew Joey and Charlie. And I'm not going to say his name today because yeah. it's pretty bombshell. But if someone wants to talk to me, my email, investigatorla19 at gmail.com, investigatorla19 at gmail.com. But um, and you can connect people to me, of course. Yeah. So yeah. Robert Shapiro began. He's the first one to come on the neck. I think it's on the 13th at night. It's, it's almost on the 14th. And he starts to assemble Pat McKenna. Uh, Tom McNally, the investigators, he's already getting on Henry Lee, Dr. Henry Lee from Connecticut. OK, 
okay, the, the forensic pathologist expert in the world, he starts to get Michael Bodden, okay? And he then, Cochran comes on a little later because when they figure we need an African-American attorney to get Cochran, that brings Carl Douglas, they merge into it. You see, there's a lot of information about how he assembles them. Um, I think he had Gerard Yeoman early on actually. So, but, but Bob Shapiro and they bring Barry Schacht and Peter Neufeld and they do DNA stuff in Innocence Project. They have the Innocence Project and they were doing stuff before. So Robert Shapiro assembles this team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty amazing stuff, you know, back then from to be so coordinated with it as well. Yeah, Just, uh, there's, a, there's a, a lot to it, man. There's, you know, there's a mountain of evidence. There's a trial that went over 10 months long. Yeah. For you to watch the whole trial, it would take you 10 months watching eight yeah. hours a day, every day. So yeah. just think about the research that I had to do on this. Yeah. I still haven't seen every minute of the trial. You can't. Yeah. It's almost impossible. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that that I didn't know that about his first lawyer, you know, walked away from the case. Yeah, Howard Weitzman. Yeah, because he started to see the evidence. And we, I have other sources too that are saying he got kicked off yeah. because they needed, yeah, they weren't, this was such a monster and they liked Shapiro. The studio exec knew who he was, kind of cold called him. He actually also cold called OJ Simpson and said, I want to help you. Wow. And OJ had no idea who he was. The reason is because the guy was a mobbed up guy. He had heavy mob connections and he personally knew Charlie and o and Joey, yeah. and he had to step in. The guy was super slick, man. I I'm not going to say who he is. He was a wealthy guy. He discovered very famous people. He died, he dropped dead in 2007 in December. He just dropped dead. And mm -hmm. um, they talk about him. If you look up the OJ on FX series and you type in new revelations or uh, American crime story, OJ Simpson, New revelations, things they couldn't reveal. They talk about this guy. So I'll let your audience do some homework. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's awesome. And what's, what's Charlie like doing today after all this? Charlie runs a strip club in Miami. Yeah. Well, wow, so he's back in that world still. A lot of those guys can, he gambles too. I think he races horses and. A lot of those guys can never get out, get away from it. They were born into the mafia. That's yeah. what the screenplay and the confession tells you. They're born into it. Their fathers and their uncles and their stepdads. And you don't, let me put it to you this way. At 20 years old, yeah. you don't have high level cocaine connections in Colombia. Yeah. Being a nobody. Yeah. Okay. You, you don't. At 20 years old, think about that. That's how old Charlie was when he went to Colombia. Wow. And made a huge connection for six months. It's it's in here. It's all laid out in here. It tells you the whole story. So you you have to be kind of initiated, I guess, initiated into the family, into the system. Yeah. Okay. Joey was the same way. Joey's dad was a famous mobster. Joey Apolito Sr. He worked for Sam the Plumber, De Calvocante. Okay. They're they're great stories. There's a yeah. lot of mysticism. There's a lot of, you know, this, you had on a couple mob, mob guys. Yeah. People love it. I'm not, I'm not here to slash and burn the mob guys. Okay. I think they all should come together. Let's go make some money. Yeah. Make a movie, tell a story, tell the story, let the people know they have a right to know and need to know. And the people who need to be really blasted are the media, the Hollywood media. Yeah. For That's sure. who's to blame. Yeah. And they would, they'd have an epic story. Like I'm sure that that's screenplay is going to be nuts. Like they, they can't should, move it. It's, yeah. You know, it's never been made. It's five years old. I mean, could they make it someday? There's a lot of press and media right now about Charlie. There's a lawsuit. We have this thing going in Miami. There's other sources came forward. People close to Kato Kalin, people close to Faye Resnick, to Nicole. They're coming forward. We, we kind of lit the brush fire, but I don't know if they'll ever make a movie. I know a guy who's close to this whole thing says he thinks they will. Yeah. He thinks they will eventually do it. Yeah. I think it, I think it'll happen. If, if more and more people start, you know, finding out about this and I think it's going to happen. Yeah. I just, I just know how Hollywood is. I know how the media is. They block stories. Yeah. They discriminate against people. They censor people. 
And a lot of people have to tell stories through outlets like yourself and other podcasts and journalists. And yeah. I think our media in America needs to yeah. change. There, yeah. there's, a, there's a major corruption of our media. And that's what Donald Trump talked about. And I know everyone's going to freak out because I say Donald Trump's name. I don't care if you freak out. So the point is, Donald Trump said the same thing, fake news, fake media. Yeah. At press conferences, he pointed out NBC reporters and said, don't let those people in. That's the president of our country saying the media is polluted. Wow. So, so yeah. you know what I mean? It, it, something has to change. And maybe this case and this whole situation can help do that. Yeah. Well, well you've been in that, in that industry for a, a long time. Do, do you have people that you've known there for the period, like your whole career going, hey, yeah, like maybe you should just keep this thing quiet or is anyone trying yeah. to? Keep you quiet about it? Of course, there were there are many people. NBC, I always I always uh, single out NBC Universal, and um, I I don't care. And I used to work for them. I've done many jobs with them. I worked for Fox, ABC, CBS, Lionsgate, Paramount, all of them. Okay, oh. and I didn't have this then. So a lot of the people they don't know me for this. They know me from producing, directing, acting, writing, doing that stuff. But many people, it's not like they're like. You better not say anything. They don't say it to you. I have a couple of people in writing I can prove block the story. I show yeah. people that sometimes from some media outlets. Um, but I do have stuff in writing from NBC, definitely doing it. And remember, who blocked the Harvey Weinstein story? NBC. Who harbors sex abusers? NBC. So they, they have tried to stop this story. I had to sign a deal with them, like kind of an NDA or not an NDA. It was more of like a a contract, a verbal and physical contract about the story, like a release. And they blocked it and they came back to me with a bunch of rude comments from their little fake producers. So I don't care. NBC, you block stories. Man, that's crazy. That's it's trying to shut shut it down and stop the mm -hmm. story getting out. And this is America though, right? Yeah. You're in Australia. You're in Australia, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is America, right? Yeah, we're the pillar and beacon of journalism right and they 20 time emmy winner nbc nope yeah. nope yeah I, I remember seeing like yeah trump calling him out all the time too and it was just, he called nbc yeah. out it was nbc yeah yeah the fake fake news i, I, I still remember that seeing it because seeing the media, that's that's right that's what he's trying to get at it's like yeah. the media just spins things for themselves yeah. you know what the hollywood media really does is they report on movies and tv shows they interview actors about their own products. That's what they, that's their news. Okay. Our news in LA is how much the box office was this weekend. That's our news. Yeah. Okay. So, so they're not real journalists. They're not. And you know, the two journalists, I know the guys who exposed Harvey Weinstein at NBC. They worked for NBC. Wow. Yeah. And they eventually got it right. And the funny thing is this is what I love about Hollywood too. NBC is making a movie about Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> they're wow. so, so they blocked the story at first, but I guess maybe they're trying to make it right. Yeah. And they're coming. They made, they already shot it. I don't know if they're shelving it. I heard a rumor. They weren't even going to air the movie. They just shot it to shut people yeah. up, <laughs> but yeah. they're the ones making So they're profiting from their own censorship and harboring a sex abuser for 20 years. Like, so it's just, yeah. They're, 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 they're morally bankrupt, right? Yeah. And I was them. I, I kind of was them. I did a lot of things kind of like that. I was involved in some of this stuff, you know? So I just kind of saw the light about eight years ago where I kind of, and I think, I think God wanted me to do this. I think they kind of shoved me out of Hollywood in a way to make me angry, yeah. right? God wanted me to get mad. And the way to get me mad enough was to keep pushing me and pushing me and pushing me giving me these cases i had the natalie wood case i had aaron hernandez emmett till okay the cal five john benet ramsey and as people refused to tell the truth on these stories it just was piling up on me you know so i have a new interview coming out in about two weeks that i really lay out some stuff and i'll send it to you and you guys can repost it and do whatever you want with it but mm. um, I, I pretty much lay it out there. And uh, I'm not opposed to working with Hollywood. I'm not. I, I, 
I would work with anybody that wants to tell the truth. Yeah. It doesn't matter their past. You know what I mean? I don't care what, what as long as you're not in jail yeah. and you don't hurt people. I don't care if you send a rude email or you call me and bitch me out on the phone for an hour. We all can win. Winning cures all, you know? For sure. Yeah, there's, there's enough to go around. Mm -hmm. if, if you could work with someone and, and you and get that screenplay out, who, who would be the best, do you think, to go to? Like, mm -hmm. would be the most honest, um, give the most honest Oliver. version? Oliver Stone. Yep. I think the only, Steven Spielberg. Yep. Directors that are very bright, that have courage, that like the truth as the entertainment and the art. Okay, I'm not saying they're gonna do it. I'm just saying, you know, Michael Mann. Mm -hmm. I tried to go to Michael Mann once. I thought he was a brilliant director. You know, he did Collateral and he and great there, there are guys that could do it. Um, and they've thrown out famous names to play Charlie. You know, it's a white guy, white actor to play him and then a black guy to play OJ and they're riding in the Bronco. There's a lot of fascinating elements that could be played, the kind of the white black thing, right? Because yeah. you have this racial issue well, I guess it wasn't that racial after all. Yeah. Right? Because there was yeah. a white guy with them. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I mean, look, there's a lot of capable directors. I mean, Hollywood has, there's brilliant directors. There's probably 20 guys or girls. Be cool to have a female do it. Have yeah. a woman direct it for Nicole. Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I hope they do it. I'm not part of the project anymore. I'm not part of the movie. I, I hope they do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be good good to see the actual true story, like like you're saying. Mm -hmm. And um, how how did you first come across it though? Like, what got you interested in this story? Why this one? Yeah, it's pretty strange. I'll give you the brief version, and I, I like right. to be anecdotal sometimes and dramatic sometimes. Right. Um, I knew the producer who knew Charlie. And I didn't know he knew Charlie. I knew him from something else. And I took a meeting with him about five years ago. And I said, what else you got? We did this project together. And I said, what else, what else do you have? And he goes, well, I got this OJ thing coming down the pike. You know, OJ? I'm like, nobody wants OJ. Who would make a movie about OJ Simpson? I'm like, well, it'd be interesting if you showed the murders. I guess, well, that's true. No one ever did the OJ Simpson movie. There were a couple of little rip off, small indie things that were done. I said, oh, you know, let me, let me, let me check it out sometime. He's like, well, I need some time. We're still, we just met the guy. We're just, I'm like, okay. So I let 10 months go by and it kind of dawns on me. I think I know what he has. I think there's somebody else because there's nothing out. What else would you tell that, that there's somebody else? Yeah. And I begin to contact him right away and we partner up and I get to read the script. I hear some of the tape. I meet some of the lawyers. Mm -hmm. I meet some of the other producers. I meet some of the sources eventually over time. And I eventually meet Charlie. It takes me a year before I actually meet him. And um, it blew my mind, man. I'll tell you, just, mm -hmm. I was the audience too. And after I read the script and I heard some of the tape, I could see this word in my psyche, in my brain that said unbelievable. It just was like flashing like this in my face. And I grew up with this story. I was in college. I was about 20 years old. I watched mm -hmm. the trial. I, I lived this case too, just like everybody else. And when that verdict was rendered on October 3rd, that gut punch to the whole country, I lived it and I felt it too. And um, when you start to put the pieces together, you're kind of like, oh my God, I can't believe they got away with it. Yep. You're like, I, how, did nobody, how did nobody figure that out? Yes, that's insane. So, yeah. Especially with so many people looking at it too. Like yeah, no, no, no. there's going to be a lot. There's a cover up. Well, you know, yeah. if a mob guy calls you up and threatens to murder your whole family, you might yeah. shut up too, right? Yeah. So you have Joey and Charlie behind the scenes yeah. planting seeds. They threatened OJ too. I had a source come forward. This person was sleeping with one of the defense team and said that OJ was threatened they would murder him wow. if he revealed Charlie, murder him. Now, remember, where is OJ? In jail. Do you think it's hard for the mob to kill somebody in jail? Nope. And they threatened his family. They threatened his kids. Yeah. 
Yeah, I had that from a direct source. Wow. So I'm just I'm just trying to say, like, you know, we can give some people an out, right? Yep. We can say, oh, you guys are all idiots. You never figured out that Charlie's the same Charlie from chapter six and the, the Judith Regan interview. Man, you guys are really dumb. I didn't figure it out either. So the only reason I knew it because they dribbled blood in the water, came to me and said, hey, you want to meet Charlie Ehrlich? Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I would, dude, if this guy didn't talk, I'll be honest with you. If he didn't speak, no one would know. I mean, maybe, maybe somebody would have figured it out. Maybe you would have, I don't know, but up to 28 years or it was 25 years when I met him, it's going to be 30 years soon, wow. 30 years. No one would have figured they didn't figure it out. Even the people that kind of knew they won't talk. Yeah. They won't say anything. The Ippolitos, they won't talk. Wow. The o OJ's best friends who kind of knew they won't talk. Some of them were dead. So there, yes. Do 30 people know? Yes, they do. 30 people knew. They didn't talk. None of them. Do, do you think there's maybe, you know, some of these older guys who were a bit more dangerous back then as, as they, they sort of start dying or I don't want to say like fade out, but more people will have the courage to come forward and go, hey, I know something about this. Um, mm -hmm. This is this is what's gone down. I believe so. And, you know, Charlie, when he came to us initially, he said he was dying. Yeah. He told us he was dying. Well, I believed him at first and then I didn't anymore after he was alive for three years. Yeah. That's not, di that's not dying. And Joe, yeah. Joe Bonanno senior said he was dying too. And he lived 17 more years. Yeah. There was another mob guy told the judge, I'm going to die in six months. They let him out. He lived for 20 more years. Wow. You have to have your head. You got to be 10 steps ahead of them, right? Yeah. So if a mob guy comes to you and goes, yeah, I was there at the murders. I was with OJ. Yeah. Did you murder anybody, Charlie? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Just take what he gives you. Yeah. If he's telling you he's there, just take it. The yeah. Irishman was similar. Frank Sheeran said they, he didn't kill Joe Gallo. They, they, they romanticized this. Did he kill Jimmy Hoffa? Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't there. Okay. He came forward as he was dying, saying this is how Hoffa got killed. This is what we did with them. Right. Yeah. So I can't say if that's true or not. They, Hollywood takes liberties, obviously. Right. Yeah. To, and that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. But so, so with Charlie and, a lot of these mob guys, they want to talk. I know another guy's got a great story. Um, I won't say he gets mad if I talk about him. Yeah. These guys have great stories in New York and Brooklyn and the Bronx. And, you know, they're trying to sell their stuff and they come on podcasts and they, they, mm -hmm. they want to boast their life. And that's fine. Yeah. If I said to you, Thomas, name me the top five American movies of all time, right? Yeah. Three of those movies are going to be mafia. Yeah. Godfather, yep. Goodfellas, yep. Bronx Tale. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe not Bronx Tale, but Goodfellas and The Godfather, you're going to say. Yeah. You won't even know it. And what are those movies about? The Mafia. Yeah. That has two in my top five. And they just redid The Godfather, the show, right? Yeah. The offer. And they're showing the come on, man. Like it's it's yeah. They they're they're doing Vito Genovese and oh, Frank yeah. Costello, right? Yeah. Robert De Niro is going to play them both. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, people used to tell us Hollywood they're all liars, a lot of them, and they would be like, you know, nobody wants any more mafia. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants any more mafia movies. That's what they said to me. And I'm just like, I'm like, well, like I would go home from these meetings. Because I've made, look, I've done some stuff. I won two Emmys. I've done some stuff in Hollywood that I'm proud of. I don't yeah. drive a Lamborghini. You don't know my name. You know, I don't yeah. got 10 girlfriends on my arms. I look where I'm at. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't make it. And maybe I'm disgruntled, but that's okay. Yeah. That's the best type of whistleblower. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's the best one. Yeah. So, but anyway, my, my point is, it's like, I would go home and I would, I would tell this friend of mine, he says, I had a couple wealthy friends and they'd be like, what'd they think of the mob movie over at uh, Paramount? 
And I'm like, yeah, I took that pitch meeting. They said they don't want any more mob movies. <laughs> and he's just, and he's, he's like, what? What are you talking about? I go, well, no, it makes sense. You know, they've done that genre over and over again. He goes, dude, they'll never stop doing mob movies. What are you talking about? Yeah. Ever. They'll never stop. <laughs> the murder, the, the secrecy, the drugs. There's all these different angles of them. Sammy yeah. the Bull wants to do his movie. Francis wants to do his movie. Calandra. Yeah. They're always pitching them. Like, so I, it kind of dawned on me. I was like, oh God, you're probably right. But um, yeah. I stopped pitching. I don't, I don't pitch the movie anymore. I, I, I took a swing on it for two years. We did have an offer at a major studio and they tried to like cut me out of the deal. Like again, disgruntled. So I just was like, man, you guys just, you know, I'm done, man. I'm, I'm just done with these people. But um, mm-hmm. this is my chance to kind of not stick it to them, but kind of use the OJ Charlie story yeah. to kind of expose Hollywood's fantasy train that they, they use yeah. and their fakeness pretty much. So maybe this was all meant to be. Yeah, maybe. I, I think it's good that you're doing it. Are you able to say what you won the Emmys for? Yeah, I won two Emmys. Wow. What, what was that for? I did a commercial and a TV show uh, with Fox. Wow. And I also won the Con Showcase, which was a short film uh, showcase in France, Paris, or no, Paris, Con. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of trophies. We won Sundance. I, I had many partners. I've done a lot of films, TV shows, commercials. You know, I don't really try to boast or kind of, you can't really toot your own horn because then you're arrogant, even yeah. though Hollywood can do it. Yeah. He's a time Emmy winner. They can do it. But if you or me, if we say we won an Emmy or con, you're arrogant, you're an asshole. So I don't even like to talk about it too much, but yeah. um, I'm proud of the things I've done, yeah. you know, and I'd like to do bigger things. In the future, I still I feel there's a lot more that I can do. Yeah, for you know, sure. I wasn't the lead person on the Emmys, like so. You know, they're teams. We're a lot. A lot of us are on teams. It doesn't. It's not one person that makes a movie, or writes a script, or produces something. They're they're teams of people. Yep. No, for sure. I think you'll do something awesome, man. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a real good. That's like those achievements there. Are, that'd be. I'd be so proud of it, man. That's cool. Yeah. What advice would you have for someone who wants to get into the investigative life like you, like yourself? Like if you're giving someone yourself, you know, how many, when you first started, if you had to give yourself advice, what would you be saying? Well, I, I don't need to give it to myself. I'll, I'll answer your question straight away of, you know, if I was to advise someone in Hollywood or you mean investigating who like true crime or wanted to be kind of a sleuth you mean yeah i, I guess yeah that that's that one like the okay. true crime and investigating more like what you do sure sure open your heart and your mind first be spiritual don't be so technical because i'm going to tell you right now you're not going to find the evidence you want to find and you're going to think you have evidence there's blood there it matches the guy Okay, that's good evidence, right? That's circumstantial evidence. That's good, but don't harp on it, okay? You have to, when you go into a case, you need to live the case. You need to be the victims, see it through their eyes, okay? A lot of true crime people, podcasters, journalists, movie producers, they they steal dead people's stories and tell them for themselves. And I'm not saying they don't have a place. I usually say the 50-50 rule. 50% they're trolling the murder, 50% they're trying to help. So if a producer goes and does the Gabby Petito story and makes a million dollars as the producer, did they help Gabby Petito? They helped themselves, right? Did they tell a story that may help someone heal? Maybe. So there's, there's like a half and half, right? But my advice to anyone that wants to be an investigative producer, a journalist, a reporter, Tell the story for the victims. Get inside their shoes first and then go in the killers. So you have this massive spectrum, right? The victim, the murderer. Get right in both of them and and everything will kind of meet in the middle for you. Wow. Yes, that's good advice. Thanks. What what about someone wanting to get into Hollywood now? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, look, I, I, I used to be very bitter. Yeah. And <laughs> my girlfriend knows that. My very good friends know that. My family knows that. So I'm not bitter I, because I don't want to ruin an industry. If yeah. you want to make movies, you want to be an actor, go do it with your heart. Yeah. Right. And, and my best advice to you, and whether you're a creator, executive, whatever, you want to be a DP. I wanted to be a DP. I want to be a cinematographer. That's what I wanted to do in the beginning. I was all visual. I wanted to visually do it. But um, my advice to you is just make the product. Don't pitch it. No one will talk to you. The agents are a bunch of jerks. Just make it. Make your content. Do it. Don't talk about it. That's the mistake I made. I should have shot feature films. I used to shoot shorts and bits and pieces and funny, weird spec spots. And I'd write screenplays and try to pitch and want to read my script. Just, just do it. Find a rich family member, <laughs> go shoot your movie, call Netflix and show it to them as a finished film. Okay. That's my best advice to you. Wow. That's awesome, man. You try to dance in that world. You try to like, I'm a, look, look, I'm not super talented. Okay, I wasn't the best actor. I'm not the best writer. I'm not Hemingway. I'm not Kerouac. I'm not. Okay, if you have supreme talent, you're gonna make it. But if you're someone like me, like kind of an average Joe, do the advice I just gave you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you seem like a cool guy, man. Like... I am a cool guy to hang out with and yeah. talk to, man, for sure. You know, I, I am. Yeah, you seem like someone I'd, I'd get along with. You know, and just that's why I'm here, it's, man. It's great talking to you. I, I, I don't know how much time you got left, but um, yeah, you can do a couple more minutes. I mean, I think if it's not too, too long, because yeah, I know my sure. friend did it, you know, it's like, you know, the, the size of a Marvel movie, like yeah. you just got to be careful. But hey, man, look, I'm, I'm willing to come on any time with you, man. You want to no. do John Benet Ramsey, you want to do any true crime, you want to do Natalie Wood, Aaron Hernandez, yeah. you want to talk about any of these stories. Dude, my door's open to you anytime. Thanks, man. I, I, I really did want to ask you about the Zodiac Killer. Oh, yeah, yeah. I put I did something in. Did you see that in Australia? No, no, I haven't. But, yeah, that's so what I wanted I'll to plug, I'll plug the guy's show, Ashes to Ashes. Okay. Reach out to him. I don't want to say his name. People get mad when I say their names. Just go to YouTube and search Ashes to Ashes, Zodiac, Chris Todd. Okay. That's it. You'll see it. He's a good guy. Yeah. Kind of met him like I'm meeting you. Kind of same, uh, you know, cool guy, nice guy, yeah. like, you know. And um, yeah, so I helped solve Zodiac. I didn't solve it because I stumbled upon these witnesses, these children who were sexually abused by the Zodiac himself. Wow. And the Zodiac is Arthur Lee Allen. And I'm going to tell you straight up. How can they never, they never caught him? Like, Well, Thomas, let's ask ourselves, why did they never catch Charlie Ehrlich and OJ Simpson? Yeah. Why? Ego, negligence, cover up, stupidity. Yeah. And I don't like to say the word stupid, fat or ugly. I tell my kids never to say those words. Yeah. So, but the Zodiac case, are we okay to give a minute to this? I'd love to give a minute to, to the victims for Zodiac. 100%, yeah. Okay, man. So there are over, there are nine other murders that the Zodiac committed. I could start naming them. Domingos Edwards um, in Santa Barbara County. Hood Garcia, Santa Barbara County. Couples murdered, okay? The Swindle couple in San Diego. The two Laotian or Thai immigrants in Sacramento in 1986, Koi and Choi, those are their first names. There's many people that got murdered that were never figured out that it was Zodiac. Arthur Lee Allen, you can rot in hell. Now, the San Francisco PD knew it was him and covered it up. Now, if we want to give them an out and say, well, they didn't cover it up because they didn't have enough evidence. Here we go again. What is evidence? Okay. They knew it was him. 
The guy ID'd him in 91, which took a long year, uh, many years later, Mike Majot, he ID'd him. That's the guy that shot me. But it took a long time. This family, these kids, I won't say their, their name. They're on YouTube. Go to YouTube. Okay? Go to YouTube and type in, we called him Mr. Allen. Wow. And watch these kids' stories. They're in their 60s now. Go listen to them. Because look, I'll give them the thunder, man. They want to yeah. come forward. Go contact them. Their yeah. email is there. Yeah. It's right there in their about section. They were abused by sexually by the Zodiac. Arthur Leone drugged them. And he took them on two murder runs. They were there. Oh, and one of them, one of them, in 1963, Domingo Edwards, they were there at the crime scene. They saw him covered in blood. Wow. They were nine years old, seven years old. They were young. They didn't talk. Their mom knew. Maybe she died. So I'm not going to try to slander her. Did the mom know? I think she did. They called her a monster. She was friends with Arthur Leone. He was a teacher at Santa Rosa Elementary School. What's wow. up? What's up? He said he was going to shoot the tires out of the, the bus and then plug all the little kitties when they came bouncing off. What's up? Yeah. And then he got caught for child molestation in the 70s, early 70s, 74, somewhere in there. And all the letters stop. And what happens when he gets back out? They get their first letter again. Watch the movie Zodiac by David Fincher. Yeah. It's a very important movie because Fincher and those actors, Gyllenhaal, Downey, uh, yeah. and, and Mark Ruffalo, had yeah. the courage. There's some real people in Hollywood. There are. There's yeah. some brilliant people. Yeah. Watch that movie. They had the courage to solve the murder. It was Arthur Lee Allen. Yeah. They show you. They tell you. That movie is so rich and so genius. Fincher and the actors and the writers, whoever I think Fincher wrote it. It's based on the book by Robert Gray Smith. Okay. Yeah. The reporter who said, I just want to know. I just want to know. I have to look him in the eyes. And guess what? I met someone that knew Robert Graysmith and was there when he went to the hardware store and looked Arthur Lee Allen in the eyes. Wow. Yeah, it's in the movie. Now, yeah, chills, man. Now I'm giving, I'm giving Hollywood a bump here. Fincher and those actors do a brilliant job. That script, that movie is so detailed, so rich, you cannot grasp it watching it once it's impossible it's impossible so if you watch it a few times right and you research in between when you watch it you'll see it but if you watch it just once it comes at you so fast like aaron sorkin you know aaron sorkin he wrote facebook and you yep. molly's game and he's like a genius savant yep. like in his language he just shoots these thing i don't know how the actors even do it like he's <laughs> He has so many words. No, he has. He's one of the best screen. I think he's the best screenwriter of all time, to be honest. But um, so Fincher's movies like that, you can't grasp it. The letters and the ciphers. Well, the and you're like, wait, 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 rewind. What? What? What did you say about the ciphers? Like, so check that out. But you know, for those victims, and obviously the the, the regular victims, Sherry Joe Bates, um, Majo. I forget some of the names sometimes, you know, uh, Lake Berryessa, um, uh, Vallejo, right? Um, Farron. There's, I don't have all the notes in front of me. My head's in the OJ thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, obviously those five victims that were attributed, there's nine more. Yeah. That's a lot, man. That's yeah. a lot. That's 14 total victims. Nine and five is 14. Okay. Yeah. And so, and look, they've done good work. Go to zodiackillers.com. Go to zodiackillerfacts.com. There's two guys. I won't say their names. They've done more research on these things. I've spoken to both of them. One guy told me to fuck off. The other guy was receptive. No, I swear to God, dude, this is like, yeah. it's like, I'm like, don't you want the truth? Yeah. Tell the truth. You knew it was Arthur Lee Allen. No, you know, I don't think it. I think it's, um, this guy, the uh, cold breaker said, a uh, cold case breaker, they couldn't break a case if their life depended on it. 
It's <laughs> Arthur Lee Allen. Stop doing fake stories. Stop yeah. telling, trying to sell your books. One guy said it was the Unabomber. Yeah. Okay. Come on. Like, and Arthur Lee Allen needs to pay. What he did to these people, he terrorized almost a country. He terrorized San Francisco and Vallejo and Napa for years. Yeah. You know? So it's like, it's like, look, my thing to the cops is, because I just did a video with this really brilliant PI and we're kind of hiding the video right now, but cops, there's some really good cops. I've met them here in LA. I've sat with them. I've met them. There's some really brilliant cops. Sometimes they're handcuffed by evidence. They're afraid of defense attorneys, guys like Cochran, Sheck, Newfelt. they are because yeah. they're smart enough, the good ones, there's some really bad cops yeah. investigatively. They know, like if they see a doubt or a hole, they know a Barry Sheck, a Peter Newfeld, a Johnny Cochran, a Bob Shapiro, they're gonna shred them. They're yeah. gonna get shredded. So they already have that inside knowledge of defense attorneys, right? They've lived it. They've testified. They've been, they've been self, themselves have been cross-examined. Examined, sorry. So they're scared. And there's 2,000 unsolved murders in LA. 2,000. So, and there's more every day, every year. So it's, there's some really good, Joe Kenda, I used to like Joe Kenda. He's on TV. He was a famous cop, brilliant investigator, brilliant. And it's just like anything. Was Michael Jordan good at basketball? Yes. Are there some really amazing cops? Yes. See, people named Billy Jensen, Paul Holes. They, they throw these names out. And hopefully someday they'll say Chris Todd. Yeah. Sure. Man, that's, yeah. But the Zodiac sure. thing, watch, yeah, watch the Ashes to Ashes. And yeah. he was trying to spread the word in Australia. Maybe you guys could team up. Maybe you guys can do something together. I'd love to bring you guys together because look, a lot of the Australians, you know, Rupert Murdoch's Australian. He owns Fox News Corporation, right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of Australian journalists in America and British. So yeah. sometimes there has to be guys that come from the outside. Get it? Yeah. They have, they, they can't be inside. And, and I think that's why it's worked for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I to, yeah, I, to, I agree with what you're saying. Sorry, yeah, I was chills from that story before, man. Yeah, man. I could send you, email me anytime. I'll show you some Zodiac shit and blow your head. Yeah. Blow your mind. What well, was the guy with the ciphers? Like, are they even anything? Or was he just so messing with people? No, they couldn't fit. Well, okay. So if you watch the movie, they'll explain how they do it. So this is the conundrum of it. So he does the ciphers. And no one can figure them out except a couple who's at their desk. They do crossword puzzles. <laughs> and so they figure out the first one. Okay. You'll see in the movie, they say it. How'd you figure out? Oh, a couple of this couple and they called us up and they solved it. They do crossword puzzles all the time. The cops couldn't figure it out. Yeah. So now the other ciphers didn't get fully the other, he did a lot of them. There's like 10 of them, five to 10 of them. There's a lot. Yeah. They were then figured out years later by these scientist guys, like these math nerds, they figured out the other ones through using a computer. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So they weren't all deciphered right away. That's why there was this allure about like, they still talk about, I just discovered the cipher. The guys did it in like 2016 or somewhere in there. But for many years, he mixed, Arthur Lee Allen mixed medieval symbols with army symbols, with code, right? With Greek and Roman and, and symbology. So he mixed them. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? There wasn't one setup. So you had to know Egyptian shit. You had to know Roman stuff. You had to know naval code. Wow. He was in the Navy. He wore the wing walker boot. It was only issued by the Navy. Yeah. He was a 10 and a half. I think he was a 10 and a half, same size as Charlie. Uh -huh. But um, so there were all yeah. these elements. He wore glasses when he killed um, Paul Lee Stein in San Francisco. He wore glasses and he walked down the street. 
They didn't recognize him. No, that's not the guy. Why? Because he's wearing glasses. You guys, come on. There's an awesome moment in Zodiac where Mark Ruffalo says to the two cops, did you talk to him? Because yeah. the cops go, we saw this guy lumbering down the street coming right at us. Did you talk to him? Yeah. No. So there's a, sometimes these are fate, man. And I don't know why God does it. I don't know if he has a sick sense of humor. I don't know if he wants to punish us. Right? I don't know. But OJ's case was that way. Natalie Wood. These are fate. These are destiny, man. These people get off. There's little hints that that or little clues that are hidden, just like that. They called in the Zodiac. They said he was black. The yep. first call that came through with the cab. Oh, the dispatcher yeah. messed it up. She didn't mess it up. God made her mess it up. Yeah. These people, I don't know why. Arthur Lee Allen dropped dead, diabetic, had a heart attack. Somebody told me, made a good point, said, I think, I think God killed him. And he was nervous because they were going to issue a search warrant for him. Literally, that was happening in like a month in 92. He died in 92. They think he just fucking fr froze up and died. Wow. So whether God took him, John Benet Ramsey, the murder, Patsy Ramsey dies in 2004. Did God take her? Maybe. So, so there's, you know, the dead have a different timeline than we do. So does God. A year to us could be one second to them. We don't know. Yeah. We, their, their time is different than ours. So, yeah, you know, I really appreciate you having me. I'm going to, I'm going to jump off now. I think this is a good yeah. length for this. I really appreciate it too. And, um, Anytime you want to do any true crime stuff, any American dramas, you want me yeah. to look at something in Australia, you have a case there you want me to look at, I'll do it for free, no problem. I'd love to help solve any type of, bring any type of justice to anybody. Wow. Thanks, man. It's, it's been a pleasure having you and it's great talking to you. I'll definitely keep in contact and we'll be linking up again for sure. Let me know when you post this thing. Just send me a little link. I appreciate that so much. And thanks again, Thomas, for all your time. No worries. Thank you too, Chris. It was, it was a pleasure. All right. See you later, man. See you, man.